Jermail Porter, my guy. First things first, let me see that hoodie. Let me see that beautiful hoodie on you. Oh, yeah. I got to cut it off. This is my workout hoodie, but yeah. Yeah, see, well, that's your, that's your craft. You work out. You yeah, train people when you work out. I got, I got a better one. This is, this is my refined going out in public one. You know, okay. Oh, that's your, that's your, like, Monday Night Football hoodie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. I that's your I'm going to stomp some Steeler fans hoodie, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This is okay. Okay. So, you and I talked, you know, you, you, it was awesome. You've done <laughs> little to no distance anything, right? Uh, basically, yeah. <laughs> I like it. Basically. I like it. I I've like that you're you're here, you're you're a face to face guy, right? Yeah, no. yeah, I've been out here. And that and your craft is such and I watch a lot of the workout videos. I can't believe how much you still sprint. Yeah. Mm. How how many days a week do you run? A couple, three, four? Like twice now. Two, three. I mean you're a massive human, dude. Yeah. You got to. That's like those mechanics you gotta keep. You got to keep them because then years can go by. You'll be like, what's the last time you went for a hard, like, sprint? You're like, that's a good question. I don't know. And that's what happens. That's how you, a tile day, you lose those skills. You are still like, I look, almost looks like you're running up like a loading dock at some of the videos. <laughs> Am I, I making just, that I, up? I, no, no, no. Some of those, yeah, actually, it was, it was the, um, the parking garage. It was a, it's a, it's a parking garage for a bank. And no, it's like no one parks there, so it's it's just empty. So you could do whatever. I could hook like a TRX up there, and just you could just go to town, man, until the parking assistant that comes out and asks you what you're doing. I'm like, dude, I'm just running. That's it. Relax. What is wrong with you? Stop it. Yeah, exactly. Stop Relax. it. Stop Come it. Come on out here. You just you know you're in a booth. Relax. <laughs> but dude, you're six foot seven, six foot eight. How much yeah. do you weigh now? Probably about uh, three sixty is probably let's say. Dude, you're three sixty right now. Yeah. yeah. I think when we talked in the spring, you're around three thirty, three forty. Uh, yeah, I was probably about forty. Yeah, about forty, three forty, fifty ish ish. Just depends. That is. I'm working my. I'm working my. I'm working my way back down for the summer. That is so once amazing. I got back once I got back in the gym, there's nothing but to do but to just lift and lift and lift and lift. So and you put uh, it I got out. Yeah, I got, I got it out of my system now. I'm good. Going back the other way. And you're still running, which is amazing to me. I can't believe how you run. You run distance, too. You don't just do, like, fart lick training, sprint training. <laughs> you, do, you do distance. Occasionally. Not so much anymore, but occasionally. But it'll accumulate. I get a lot of sprints, and it'll accumulate. Uh, you get a lot of distance out of that. Okay, so having you on the Barbarian Hour is special to me because when I first started this, I had no name for my podcast. I was just like, hey, I'm talking to a bunch of random people. You were one of the random people I talked to last spring when this, the lockdown started and COVID-19, yep. we were in the first like two, three months of it. And you've always been a huge advocate for personal freedom, allowing people to do their thing. Hey, let me run my business. Let people, if they want to come here, let them take the risk or assume the risk of coming here and you're still really outspoken about it. I don't see as many let's argue posts. I've noticed a lot less on the social media because I'm not going to lie to you. I mouth off to you on social media <laughs> and I know people got to be like, dude, who is this guy mouthing off to Jermail? What is this guy doing? Jermail is flush, right? I love it. I love mouthing yeah, off to you. I, I like I, mouthing I, off I, to you in person too though. Yeah, it's a good rapport. Yeah, I, I love know it. What? The minute um. The minute they lifted the restrictions, I, I, like I said, I had, I, I had no more beef with anybody, man. It's just like, all right, let me go back and do, I'm doing my thing. We'll take all the necessary safety precautions and this, that, and the other. But like, you know, I was, uh, I was not a happy camper for two months. Dude, you um, were so hot and bothered. Yeah. Every so day. A lot of things I was saying then are being, um, uh, basically, uh, validated now, um, a year later of what I was saying. And it's kind of like, I was saying that a year ago, you know, uh, and it's kind of like, um, it's common sense stuff, but the overreaction was just like, I was, just, I was just in awe and just, uh, I'd never seen anything like it. We probably, you know, I don't know if we will see anything like it again, hopefully not. But Man, like, I hope not. I really hope not, Jamelis. 
I've been really else. disappointed, man. I've been disappointed yeah. with our response as, as Americans. I just yeah, been disappointed. Else, the divisiveness is very disappointing to me. And and yeah. that's the big thing with me. I, it's it's just super disappointing, all of it. it, it both sure. directions for me personally. I've just been very disappointed with uh, being overzealous about things. And then, you know, if people want to be cautious, I understand that. And I want yeah. people to take precautions if they want to take yeah. them. But some of the mandates I feel like have been um, maybe not fair to some people like yourself. Right. And I struggle with that a lot. You know what I mean? And, and I get it. I understand that the greater good and health, but right. man, there's just so many things I struggle with on a daily basis. And you know, I yeah, teach at was... school, man. I teach at a school and, and um, <laughs> I feel, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I think my school got it right. I'm, I'm really happy with how my school has reacted to it, Jermail. Sure. And we're very adamant about the kids staying in person. Sure. And I'm pretty thankful to be at the school on that. They, they've done an awesome job. Our administration. That, that's, that's the untold story from years from now is the effect of what happened to the kids during this year. And I heard it from um, a number of parents, just the psychological effect of kids kind of like almost going into an early depression the first six months, because it was just like you took away the social um, nature of what makes them them like what's yeah. so awesome about going to school or what's so awesome hanging with your friends they didn't understand at the time and it was just like we won't know the effects i imagine two years later you know down the road when they start coming out and really start telling you what happened but i think that was really crucial for some of those kids or it really devastated some of those kids um during that time it's been crushing to the youth mm. of this country mm -hmm. it's been crushing to you know between 50 and 100 million kids it's been crushing oh, yeah. them. And oh, yeah. I, yeah, and here, here's the thing, and here's what I got to say for my children, right? Sure. My kids are three and five, right? And we hiked every day. When you and I talked last year, we were hiking every day. That's we good, went. man. It was awesome. And my That's thing is – I see the like, videos. Dude, you were out into God's country. It was Tilly. awesome. It's awesome out here. You got to get out to South Chagrin, Jermail. I, I, you don't need to sprint the hills there or anything. Oh, they're yeah. dangerous. But um, it is awesome where we are. And, we, you know, we got a lot of really cool parks. And it's almost like a Western PA feel, you know, the Chagrin River yeah. Valley, Grand River Valley up by where I work. But I just, yeah, kudos to my administration at my school. I mean, I'm there for a reason. And right. they validated how um, I'm just, I have a lot more confidence in them now. We've yeah, never, um, we went remote, but we went remote when everybody else went remote, you know, in sure. December, uh, you know, uh, November, December, in the early part of, of January. But, you know, we were, we've been back since I think January 14th, I want to say. That's good, man. And, and, That's good. and I just, I really believe in the kids. But my biggest thing was always preparing the kids. Every day I was a broken record. Hey, you know, <laughs> we control what we can control. Be prepared to go online. It can happen. And now, uh, I feel very confident that we're going to stay through June, through our, our end date. And, but, you know, Jermail, anything can happen. You know, you don't take anything yeah. off the table now. <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you've learned nothing in the last 12 months, yeah. expect anything. Expect literally anything. It, literally I, I, anything. Nothing, nothing is impossible. It, nothing's impossible. But, like, the biggest thing, like you just said, I'm sad for the youth. Yes. I'm sad yes. for the kids who, you know, and, and, and it's good for you. you. You don't have to worry about Zooming. No, no, this is the second no. time you've ever zoomed. You told me. second time I've ever had, like I said, the, the, I had to re download the app because I only used it one time and that was with you. Everything else, you know, you know. So when the pandemic hit, I have an also group of young athletes, student athletes. We went outside, man. We went, we went to the, we went to the parks, we went to parking lots, and the kids were able to train. And some days it was snowing, some days it was raining. But I would load up the back of my SUV and just haul stuff out. So they were really, you know, they were still gung ho. And I, you know, I had a lot of sessions outdoors, and you know, they were they were pretty tough about it. And you know, and it, it, it got it kept those guys ready to go. You know, you do what you're, dude. There's a story of my brother was uh, at Westlake, which is not too far from us, the rec center. There's hills over there, and Kareem Hunt and his trainer were working out doing the, exist, the same thing we were doing but it's kind of like it was a moment that you were able to look at like you know a, a, either adult fitness or 
our, 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 our youth athletes to say, like, you see Kareem Hunt's doing the exact same thing you're doing because he's in the exact same situation you're in. Instead of sitting at home playing Xbox, you know, he went out there, he's out, he's out here running heels just like you are, you know, and that was a, that's kind of like a validation as far as you're doing the right thing and controlling, like you said, controlling what you control. That's all we can do. He's got some tools, maybe some additional physical tools. Yes. <laughs> he's yes. a freak, yes. dude. Yes. He's an absolute well, dude. When in doubt, man, it's bare bones. It's, you, you know, he, had, he was out there with his guy, and, you know, you, it's the same sort of template. You go out there, and you got what you can use, what you can grab, and that was the, and that was the theme for two or three months that you got to go out there and make it happen. Rain, snow, sleet, shine. Didn't matter. We got chased off a couple times by the police. Um, I saw the times. videos. I saw the videos when they were driving. They were Army creeping manager, by your gym man, a couple it, times. You, you were know, so it, mad, dude. You were big mad. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't stop though. You're like, all right, we're gonna go somewhere else. They keep chasing us out. You know, they can't control everything. That's true. And and my thing is, in your eyes, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right. You're taking precautions. Exactly. You're spacing out. You're outside. You're training all outside. That. You know, so I got to give you a lot of respect for that. And, and at the same time, you're trying to adhere to safety protocols yeah. and taking it to the next level by being outside, right? Sure. Yeah. Man, it was no hit in the face. I kept asking, hey, man, you good? Or, hey, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Good. You know, all right, let's keep rolling. <laughs> let's, let's, keep, let's keep going. You know, man, like, and I look at your story. It's such a crazy story. The, the Germail, yeah. you're like Forrest Gump, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you have you have an amazing story. I was telling my boss today. He was a state champ uh, for North Olmstead in the eighties for uh, Tom Milkovich, and then he was a, a D line starter for Ohio State for four years. Oh, um, you know in the Big Ten, and and um, I started telling him your story, and I'm like, yeah, this guy never played. He never played a down of football, and then Belichick saw him and picked yep. him up for the practice squad for four or six months or whatever it was. <laughs> right, right. Like, really? Yeah. I said, yeah, then Kansas City picked him up for – so you were on, you were in just under, like, two seasons as a practice yep. squad player in the NFL, right, Jermail? Yep. That is amazing. The fact that you never played varsity, JV, freshman, any of that football. I was like, he played in the band, as a matter of fact, at Firestone. And it's just amazing to think how out of the box a guy like a Belichick thinks, right? Obviously, you you learned that firsthand, you know, dealing with him and how he picked you up. I my thing is, do you have a lot of photos? I know there's photos where they have a decalless helmet on you and he's in the picture with you. Do you have a lot sure. of photos from training camp or anything? Uh, no, because you know, all right, so put it. There in, are photos. Uh, I know there are photos. There's photos, but like personal photos. So I like had a flip phone or a Blackberry in 2009, 2010. I mean, we didn't have, it wasn't like, you know, I know, I mean, I wasn't whooping it. You would have had to use a digital camera to get like candid pictures, you yeah. know, and, you know, so. But there's also, media photos of you. There's actual photos. Yeah. Like if I Google you, Jermail Porter Patriots, there's, yeah, a, it's, there's a mug it's shot. Like, it's like something like that. And they were real no phones in, in pretty much both locker rooms. I mean, you really didn't pull your – I can remember getting there in the morning and whoever I had to talk to, I talked to like in the locker room and before breakfast, and then that was it. You didn't hear from me until like 6 o'clock that night, you know. You know, there's just really no, no outside – you know, I'm sure it's way different. 10, 11 years now later, but then it's like, everybody was like, you know, phones, you don't know what, what, what you can use. We don't want anybody, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. It, it, as far well, as, yeah. you know, the places I were, I was. You, you missed their, uh, Aaron Hernandez too, didn't you? Yeah. I was not, I was not there during uh, Aaron Hernandez. What a mess, dude. I yeah. watched that thing last year and we talked, I remember. Mm-hmm. And what a mess that whole thing. And what a freak that guy was. Yeah, uh, there's a yeah. lot of uh, unanswered questions. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and just a, just an incredible athlete, though. You know what I mean? That's a phenomenal athlete, man. Phenomenal athlete. Just yeah, a lot of a lot of question marks there. Yeah. Did you miss Gronk too? Yeah, they came in the same year, so I was gone. I was I was in Kansas City when they when they were drafted. Got it. And then, did you? No, you were you were there with Edelman, weren't you? Oh yeah. That's oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Julian Edelman's a stud, dude. Oh yeah. And then you, you were at I, uh, Kent yeah. State when he was playing football there, weren't you? 
That is wild. That is really wild. And then yep. you're a practice squad player. How long were you with the Patriots for? Four months? Six months? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Four months. Four or five months. And then as soon as they released you, Jermail, did you then go right over to Kansas City, pick you up right away? No, I had a, uh, a couple of tryouts with the Dolphins, like two or three maybe. And then I had to go out to Kansas City twice. And then um, – I think I sat at home for maybe a couple of weeks, if that, and then uh, then um, then that's when uh, they they called me and said they wanted to sign me. But then I had to do another conditioning test when I when I, when I went back there. So when they fly you out for tryouts, basically you do their conditioning test and they put you through a simulation. So whatever they, each team has their own conditioning test, and then they have some sort of like play simulation they'll run you through. I, I imagine it's different for my position, but as an offensive lineman. You had to go out there and you ran X amount of plays, X amount of run plays, X amount of pass plays, whatever they want to see, they show you. So every time you go out there, it's not like you're going out there to um, just to look at you from an aesthetic standpoint. They actually try to put you through, <laughs> put you through a lot of work, and then you get to shower up and you know you might grab a couple Gatorades, whatever food, and then you go to the office and they say yeah or nay, and that's kind of how it works. And then like so you go home at home. So they fly you out, put you up in a hotel, and then you go home. And, or they tell you, hey, you're staying out here. It just, it just, it just, it just depends. So you have to be ready. Like your one bag could be the bag that you are keeping <laughs> while, while you're there, or that could just be, you know, you going home. And they have all your information like immediately. So if you're going back, they got it. Where do you live in Kansas City? Where did did they have a condo for uh, you? Did you have no? To so I had to. So uh, so the. So when I first got there, I lived in um, – so they comp you, like, the first couple weeks uh, while you're there. So I, it was at the embassies. Embassy, embassy suites. suites. And then once that was first couple weeks of them comping you, it's over. You know, they look for you to find your own as far as lodging. So the reasonable thing is you go find a lesser expensive hotel. So I went to uh, – do I want to say Howard Johnson? I, I kind of want I, – I think it was Howard Johnson. Like they give you a sheet of recommend, recommended places. Based upon your pay grade, they, like, itemize it. So if you're, like, a, a, like a NFL vet journeyman that you got a house in Miami and a house here, so you don't care. You can stay at a Hamasy suite for a grand a week. It doesn't matter. You know, you know, your check's probably 20 grand to every paycheck. You don't care. You know, or if you're with other guys like I was, like a practice squad guy, you're like, how much is it a week? All right, I think I can swing this, you know. Um, and so I think I lived in a Howard Johnson for like eight weeks, eight or nine weeks during the season. And then I went home. And I, and, and I had a rental car. And I remember um, basically it made, it made more sense to buy one when, we were out, when I was out there because the rental car was something like $1,000 a week almost, you know. So, so you're something. still driving that. It's like an SUV, isn't it? No, 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 no. Yeah, I got, I, uh, I've long since got rid of it. I drove it, uh, I drove it for about, like, maybe about four years after. It was sweet, you know, the Tahoe. Um, but yeah, no, I, I've, uh, I've uh, long since got rid of it, but it was reliable. I, cause I, when you get out there, you live out there, and then, you know, they say, hey, we're gonna bring you back. We're gonna resign you. So your last couple of days out, you go out, you sign your contract, but all the belongings you've accumulated that you came out there with a bag, now you have like five bags of stuff because you've been living out there. You pack up and you drive back. So now I came back with a, I flew out there to get out there. Now I'm coming back with a car and a trunk full of stuff because I've been living out there for eight So that's kind of how it works. So did they, okay. So when the season's over, Kansas City didn't make the playoffs that year, did they? No. So the season's over. Okay. Yeah. You just drive back to Akron? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I clean, you go, the last day, you clean out your locker, they do exit meetings, like I say, you sign your contract if you're coming back, which I think you did it the day before or the day of. And they brought um, you back, right? They brought you yeah, back so, after that. Yeah, initial. yeah, yeah, so next season I came back. So um, you were almost there for two and a half seasons, basically, yeah. you count the, yes. the, the four to five months with the Patriots, and then a season, the, a second half of a season, and in the first half, so you were there three seasons essentially, parts of three seasons. Yes, yes, I was, I was, I was, uh, I caught some good times in there. 
but yeah, you drive, you drive back and you drive back uh, 14 and a half hours to Acker. And you say, okay, so what now for two months? <laughs> so you go back out. Well, there. you got to train. Obviously you're a professional athlete. Yeah, no. Yeah. You train. I mean, you're training uh, hard. Yeah. But it was like, uh, you, you're so to put it in perspective, I left Kent from my college house and, but I never really moved out. I went right to new England. So like, my, my mom took the rest of my stuff as far as uh, my house as a senior in college. So I left there and everything's in storage. And when I go, I go to Cle or, um, New England for four or five months, I get cut. I come home for a matter of weeks and then I'm back in Kansas City for the remainder of a year into the next year. So I come home and I'm like, this is the first time I've been like in Ohio for an extended period of time since 2009. So That's I was crazy. like, all right. <laughs> so, wow. so I have to figure out my bearings and what's going on. And then I'm like, all right, I, I, I moved in with um Tanner Shear and uh uh Corey Upper and uh all those guys. <laughs> Are you, start, what I was that like? Guys. They were they were going nuts, they were losing their minds, and you're a professional athlete. You live with so, those guys. Yeah, so they had a room <laughs> and, uh, and, they live uh, on like Summit Street? Where did they live on Summit Street yeah. or yeah, I remember started. that. Did you live by the Kent the Kent Library? Is that the house you moved out of? The, you lived there with Shine, right? Yeah, I lived there. Dude, it was the uh, Little Caesar next to the Sheets out there. We lived in the – we called it 8 Mile, the double wide. <laughs> so Kent wine, the Kent Wine Store, wherever that was, Wine. Yes. Wine, yeah, and there was a camera right. store next to it. Yes. yes I didn't know how the camera there. store stayed open. I'm like, who goes and buys a camera? Come on. <laughs> I, had no, I had no idea. Never one step foot in there. So yeah, I moved to Kent for the two months and live with them because I, I had access to um, the campus and the weight room and you know I had so I, that's where I worked out at. There's no point in getting a gym membership living in Akron. Uh, well, true, yeah. I mean, but but what's so crazy about it? Is you went back and lived a college lifestyle <laughs> and then jumped back in with the Kansas City and, Chiefs for spring and, and, training or whatever. Yeah, we, uh, we reported for off-season training. Yeah. Dude, I was everywhere. That's what I'm saying. Like, I just, I was just everywhere, all over, all over the place. So, did you travel? You were on the 53 man roster. Did no, you I, I didn't. So, the, you were, I was part of the nine practice squad guys. Got it. So, those guys don't travel unless they activate you. Got, okay. So, here, 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 here. This year would have been the year to be a practice player if you wanted to play. Because uh, remember the Browns? Well, wait, no. Remember the Browns against the Jets? Yeah. They would have taken you. They would have had to have. And then get COVID tests, but yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, sure, right. You, we, okay, okay. We, we get that one. But the point is, they were bare bones. Oh, yeah. They yeah. were all hands on so, deck. The one guy ha has an apartment in Avon, which is about 15 minutes from me, and he's in there doing, because he couldn't get into the facility, he was in there doing uh, pass sets in the parking lot, and somebody was filming him because that was him getting ready to get ready to go to walkthroughs. I think it was a Friday afternoon, Saturday had walkthroughs. He's in there on Twitter doing pass sets. I was like, dude, that's dedication. It was like raining or snowing that day, but he couldn't get into the, you know, because of the COVID thing. Yeah, they, they, shut, they so shut the Maria down. So he had to get a workout in. So wow, he's like, oh, man, dude, wow. I was like, yeah, man. It is such it's a, and it was shot. crazy this year too, man. And, you know, here was the greatest thing about it. You really see where the Browns are in the pecking order of the NFL. Yes. When the Browns get a COVID thing that runs through their team, oh, no, you got to play the Jets. It doesn't matter. Same time, noon, whatever it was. <laughs> How many times did Baltimore and the Steelers get postponed? Because the answer is four. Because that game mattered a lot more. That mattered right. a lot more. But, and then, you know, we were, we were there biting our nails till the end because mm -hmm. we lose that game to the Jets. Then we got to beat Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. It was a mess. It you was a mess. The Browns, what they matter, and how much real parity there is in the league when they right. treat the Browns like that. And then, how, and then you treat the Steelers and the Ravens, you, you give them a Wednesday afternoon game. Yeah, they pushed it all the way back to the middle of the week. I'm like, how is four, this fair? Four, they, they, they postponed it four times. Like, how is that fair? It doesn't matter. We, we had two wins in a row over the Steelers exactly. in the season. We, we made we made the postseason, finally. <laughs> yes, and won a game and beat the Steelers. I don't and know. And won a game and beat the Steelers. And then, and then, and then I, yeah, and listen. 
I know you weren't cheering, cheering for the for the Chiefs. No, I wasn't. There's no way you could be. But if you were I understand some loyalty, they they paid you some jack. You got to live out there. I get yeah, it. Yeah, you know, it's it's almost like it's a hometown team versus a former employer. But it, reality is, the staff when I was there is different. So it's kind of like, you know. It's cool, but it's not the same. You, you know? said the, the the staff and the whole roster had turned over from when you played there. Oh, yeah. It had turned over, and it was, was yeah. it 10 years, right? Since they, they it's, it's been 10 years, yeah, man. Yeah. Not, you I mean, said that. You're like, yeah, there's not a single guy on the roster <laughs> that I played with. and uh, Nobody. Yeah. And just your, yeah, your story, though. When you told me your story, and I just heard your story and what I know about you, and and what wrestling did for you, yes, wrestling transformed Jermail Porter from. Tell the story. Tell the story about school and going to school. Tell the story about Firestone. Talk about showing up as a, as a jalopy. What your freshman? A jalopy freshman. Yeah, I was just a chubby kid, and so I posted that in my story. The kid that the kid that got in a fight with that MMA kid, um, the Oklahoma football player, I was like, that's literally what happened the first week of school for me. And I saw this dude, the smaller dude, just trounced this bigger dude. And I remember thinking, the dude was a football player. This other guy was, you know, one of the ex wrestlers. He wasn't even on the team. I mean, he just trounced him. I remember thinking, like, all right, well, the decision's made. I know what sport I'm going to do because <laughs> that dude, that dude just, that dude just slammed the other dude and he swallowed him. And I, I remember thinking, um, I'm going to go to the wrestling meeting next week. And I literally, I had a friend who wrestled in middle school and he, uh, he said, well, the meeting's next week if you want to go. And that was literally what I did. I almost talked myself out of it, and, but I'm, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> but yeah, I went and that was literally how I went. It was like it was like self defense on steroids. I was like, man, you know, because I, you know, I don't have an older brother, so it was like I, I went to school. I was, you know, none, none of them, I had no cousins there. It was like, dude, like what happens if it's just me here? So like, I better, I better, I better, I better get to some training here real, real fast. And that's that's literally what I did. That is wild. How violent was that encounter? in that bathroom with that Oklahoma wide receiver yeah. and those dudes they picked a fight with. Yeah, it's a bad move. The guy in the jean jacket get his head bounced off the wall by the stall. Mm -hmm. And he's out. He's done. Yeah. And the one guy is just feeding him the just bah, bah, bah. It is a bad idea. <laughs> to, to, it's it's for, for wrestling is the – earliest form of hand-to-hand -hand combat legalized hand-to-hand -hand combat you can have and it's different than martial arts at that age like it's literally it's human chess but it's like violent human chess and it's like you you're wired differently and you can see people who don't have that sort of training like for instance for example those guys are division one football players but that level of hand-to-hand -hand combat and just like relative strength for that smaller guy to literally he body locked them and tripped them to the floor. Like it just negated everything. And then like, the boots it, came it, in and he got, and he got boots. boots in while wearing cowboy boots, which was hilarious. That was the funny. was like, Oh, I get it. Cause that's where the boots, you put the boots in he's wearing cowboy boots. And they broke that guy's orbital socket and the guy almost yeah. lost his eye. Dude, he, you, there was a very valuable lesson. And I was like, look, if you see a guy who has any amount of years he'd spent on some mat time, that dude is not afraid to, to, to tangle if he has to tangle. And that's a life lesson. But remember, I said that when I was 13. When I saw that firsthand, I was like, oh, the decision's made. This is real simple. I, I, I know what sport I'm going to play. And that was it. So to one of my dumbest questions ever, Nobody messes you when you with you go out. You go out to a bar. You go out to somewhere. No one's no. unless it's like me, like hey, hey Jeremy, yeah, no, like trying I mean, to be a jerk. I mean, yeah, no, no, no one. <laughs> no, yeah, no one does. I mean, I mean dude, you, you are you are six foot eight, three hundred and sixty pounds. Yeah, you're a Division One All American. You're a former NFL football player. I don't know. <laughs> Look at your beard. Yeah. Your beard makes you look 450 pounds. The height, <laughs> the height I look up at you and I get dizzy. It, it's, it's just, I, what are people thinking? What are, I mean, 
I get the smaller Ooh. wrestler dude and you're picking on him, but Ooh. like you, you don't ever have that problem, do you? No, 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 not intentionally. I mean, I can't think of, I mean, even when I moved to Cleveland, I was uh, 24, even when I was like 24, um, no, I, I didn't, I didn't have any bounce instances of any sort of like, uh, altercations, you know, you know, I watched plenty of stuff happen during those days of the West six glory days, but I, I was never a part of that. <laughs> West six glory days. <laughs> the, West six, the warehouse district glory days of uh, Cleveland. You know, I, I, I saw plenty of it during my time there, but uh, no, I can't say, uh, I can't say um, anybody's ever done that. How often do you get, are you someone famous? Are you an NFL football player? How often do you get that? Um, if I don't control my ecosystem, just about every day. Even wearing a mask. Even have to put, I got my, I got my, um, I don't have one here. I got my, my gym, and even wearing a mask, it's like, People can't help themselves. <laughs> you're, you're, but I control my you're ecosystem. Six, eight, I, 360 pounds. What do you want them to think? Dude, and I always tell people, I'm like, I, I'm turning 35 in May. I can't. The illusion that, like, and I think that's what people have to understand. Even with football, right, the athleticism level is so high. Like, I had to be 23. I was 23 coming off of All-American campaign. That's how I got in. Like, you have to put into perspective, like, the level of athleticism you need just to be an outsider in there. Now, imagine the guys who are being drafted in the top six rounds, the top seven How rounds. elite they are. Right. How like, elite like, they are. How about how – about I'm, humbly, I'm humbly saying, like, like, no, there's no – like, even though if a team sucks on Sundays – those guys are far better athletes than you could even imagine. That's why they're there. Listen, how absurd is the argument when people are like, oh, "I bet you the, uh, I bet you the Alabama can beat the Jets." Uh, that's completely absurd. It's For absurd. example, it's like if those guys. I think college football rosters carry what ninety guys, whatever it is. One hundred twenty <laughs> if it's Ohio State. But, yeah, one hundred twenty guys, guys. You might there might be year to year there might be ten guys within seven rounds that get drafted, maybe a couple guys off of um, from I might might get some undrafted offers and things of that nature. And an entire team is made up of guys who were either hand picked or drafted to that team. So everybody that's on there at one point was the best in their position on their college team. So you have to put it in that perspective is like everybody there was the best. And there's, there's, just, there's just the talent level in the NFL is just so high. Like you have to take that to account but no Alabama could not beat the Jets <laughs> those are still like you know high round draft pick those guys are still spectacular athletes it wouldn't be close it wouldn't matter how no. good the game plan no Saban has or Lane it would be Kevin like saying or... like high school and college like you know a high school football team could be uh you know a division one a division one high school could be a division one college you would never say that no because it would not it would not happen no same yeah. thing wouldn't that happen no. Yeah, I saw some wild stuff in my time on the field, in the weight room. Uh, I saw some things that made me question, like, I, I, again, like, I see why he is getting paid all the money he gets paid. Like, I, I get it now because I cannot do those things. I couldn't do those things uh, ever, you know, so I, I get it. Did you see the Miles Garrett box jump? I did. <laughs> I did. That's a that's a that's another case of just sheer <laughs> half measures. He's two hundred seventy five pounds, and I think he came back and said it was fifty eight, but sixty four fifty eight. He was standing vert. He jumped up there two hundred. He displaced two hundred seventy five pounds into the ground and leaped fifty eight inches into the air. That's like a, that's like a big cat in the jungle. Like he just did that. You know, you have to put it like, and he lines up across from you, and you have literally a second to get your best game plan to stop him so he doesn't kill your quarterback. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's – sometimes it just blows your mind. That's an all-day job. That's an all-day – that's an all-day job right there. Think about this. You would have been in potentially in a position to block a guy like that. Yeah. Dude, I, I – I, I had a pretty solid rotation in both – uh, New England and Kansas City of practice, uh, you know, w daily practices of who I would play against. And, like, again, 
um, like you makes you question your own athleticism because you're just like you come from an arena where you're one of the best, you're confident in your skills, and just from a standpoint, not X's O's, but just physical ability. And then you see like this this guy that got plucked from some Big Ten college, and he's just a freak. And it's speed, it's power, it's it's athleticism thrown at you like that, and you have to react. And you get you get better, but it's just like man. This is some hard. This is hard. This is hard. This is hard work. Did you get bull rushed and trucked and just planted on your back a bunch of times? Dude, so this is how I'm not dating myself, I guess. So when I was in Kansas City, was uh, Mike Vrabel's last year in the league. Um, he was in Kansas City too, and uh, I remember. So he was playing linebacker. Um, so I got bull rushed like twice in one day. Actually, it's kind of funny. One um one time um was um. Tom Bahali, he played for Penn State, um, and he was in Kansas City. And he got me, and it was icy out one day. And he and he just put me on skates, and I saw my own shoelaces. He hit me so hard, I saw my own shoelaces as I was flying in the air, going backwards. And I remember sucks, the dude. ground was <laughs> the ground was so frozen that like I, I I just bounced. I bounced with pads, and I just like I just laid there for a second, and then I heard the coaches get up. You're not hurt. Get up. And I'm like, okay, I'm up. I remember uh, also uh, old man Vrabel got one on me too. Uh, here's another one that he did like a little stutter step. And then I next thing I know he hit me in the chest. And the next thing I know I'm like falling backwards again. Cause I'm high as a kite right now. Cause I'm standing up and they're just, their leverage just hits you in the pads. And that's what I'm saying. Like I can only imagine having to pass block versus miles Garrett. Cause it's like, Oh my goodness. That's a, that is you get high. You get high and you're naturally just your six. Yeah, I'm high. So, in my mind, it's like when two <laughs> bears fight, they stay on their hind legs. They get up, they think they're – Yeah, for sure, for <laughs> sure. They think their leverage is up there, but they stay low. They stay low in their trajectories at an angle. So they go low to high, and they hit you, hit you right into the pads, and they know just to put the hands there. Unreal. And just take, and take you out, and that's, uh, that's the game. Unbelievable. Yeah. I look at it, and I, it's just – it's wild to think about it. But talk about your progression from freshman year, joining the team. You see a guy get absolutely just felonious assault in the hallway yeah. at yeah. Uh, Firestone. Talk about your progression from starting this out. You're the oldest brother, right? It's just you and your brother, isn't it? Yeah. And then talk about your progression from there because we, we talked about it. We've discussed it before, but – what was that progression like for you in wrestling? And you only did wrestling. You played in the band at Akron Firestone High School. Yep, sure did. Talk about that um, progression. So the progression was very simple. Um, I just could control. We didn't know enough about the sport of wrestling, so I didn't know there was camp. And some of the coaches would later on when they saw I came back the next year. So my 10th grade year, they were like, all right, this guy came back. Because my first grade, my ninth grade year, they were like, all right, we'll see if he comes back. I was, I was one of those guys. But one of the things I knew I could always control um, and I was always into was I just wanted to get physically stronger. So a lot of times, things I could control was the weight room. So I lived the weights, and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't going to the weight room. My parents, um, I was fortunate enough, they bought just about everything I needed, and they put it in the basement. I just, I mean, I was working out twice a day. And I went from, like, 213, 212, you know, I wrestled 215 that freshman year. I think that soft, my sophomore year, I came back about 250. And then, so, I, so I, I jumped up. And at that point, I was just about stronger than everybody in the high school. I mean, I had nothing going on during that entire offseason, just lifting weights and eating at every day. 215 as a freshman. Yeah. For, were, for you, were you 6'3", six, 6'4"? Six How tall were like you? I was 6'1", maybe. 6'1", six six maybe. Um, okay. You know, so, I, wasn't, I wasn't opposing at all. Yeah, but like now you're imposing. You're an imposing yeah, figure. There's no now, question about now, it. Not imposing. I wasn't imposing. I mean, they didn't think I was coming back. If you ask a lot of the coaching, like they didn't. I mean, this guy took his lumps. I got pinned a lot. I didn't want to match. Did, were you on the varsity? I wrestled one varsity match, and um, and uh, I got pinned. And that's another thing. I got pinned in front of a bunch of girls. I went to our school. They were at the dual meet. It was so embarrassing. And it was like those little those little life lessons you remember in your head. And that dude pinned me right, and he hit his, and he he pinned me like in the most disrespectful cradle. 
you could put a person in and it was just like it was just like it was so disrespectful i was so embarrassed and i remember thinking like i'm not gonna let that happen again if that's not in control that's why that's why i started pumping iron heavy so you put on 40 pounds of muscle yeah yeah how many inches did you grow i was i was uh definitely six four when i came back so you're six six, four four. you grow three four inches you put on 30 40 pounds yeah you look like a different human so yeah, you got okay. in your only varsity match. How, what was your JV record as a freshman? Did you win? Uh, I I, I, uh, I don't think I won a JV match either. You yeah, I got you, I got you didn't lot. win any matches as a freshman. I, in I didn't win a JV because we had like a JV tournament. Which I didn't. I think I went two and could do on that one too. Like I just I was there getting beat up in practice, and I was getting beat up <laughs> in matches. I, so that's why I think I was coming back because I I was just I was just getting beat up a lot. <laughs> But it was good. And you and you were in the marching band. I was I was in the orchestra actually, not the marching mar, marching band orchestra. So I was playing the string instruments. Can you still play? Yeah, I still got guitars and stuff. I can still play. What did no, you? No, I'm not orchestra. Um, or, oh, I played the uh, the the bass, the big one. The big ones, the big one in the back one. Yeah, that was yeah, that was that that, that was me. That's awesome. So, yeah, that's that, yeah, that's what could I was. Could you doing. you could still pick a bass up? Is it like riding a bike? Yeah, I can't read music probably, but I could probably play by ear though. If I want to just, I do that. I do that enough. Yeah, I probably can read music that well anymore. Okay, so you're in the orchestra. Yeah. You're a defeated wrestler. You don't win a match. You don't win a JV match. You don't win a varsity match. You get you get disrespectfully cradled in front of all the girls as a 15-year-old. All the girls that came to their match, they're like 13, 14. I get no respect. I'm just low man to them full. Can you believe that? <laughs> I can, actually, because, because I remember your senior year. I want, I want the progression. But I've, I've told you this before. Andrew's like, we we got that guy. He's good. And then Tony Johnson <laughs> pinned you in the state finals. And I'm like, yeah. that guy's not any good. I'm like, that yeah. guy's not any good. I'm like, I'm like, look at him. He looks like his legs look like stilts. He's yeah. like, doesn't look Awkward. athletic. Awkward. Yeah, man. I'm like, that guy's no good. He's going to come. He'll be average. Boy, was I wrong, and I'm glad it was kind of. It was kind of looking at Tony Johnson. I remember looking at you know in the, in the war room because that had been that had been the closest I'd gotten to him all week because we were obviously inside the brackets, obviously. And I remember thinking like, hmm, that dude looks like that dude looks like he. Is, is we sure he's in the twelfth grade right now? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. Like I feel like he's a little bit older than me. Um, you know, up until that point, I had ran to that caliber of athlete still. You know, I, you know, we were. Firestone. So our biggest tournament was the D's tournament. Um, you know, we didn't go to Iron Man. We didn't go to BC East. We didn't go to, you know, and, and a lot of the guys I saw were, you know, mid-level guys, you know, the most of the year. And then here I am going against, you know, a caliber wrestler like him. And it's like, oh, this was. World champion MMA guy now. Right. Exactly. In a promotion, I want to say in like Poland or Russia, right? Something, something like that. Yeah, yeah it's Poland to Russia. Yeah, something like that. He's making a, good money. It looks like. Yeah, he's he's out there. But imagine that as a high schooler. That's like the again the talent level. I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't prepared for that. that, that uh, and fact. he's what is he six two six three? Yeah, he was shorter than me, but he was just I mean, faster. I imagine stronger at time. It was just it was a mismatch. I had I had cleaned out the best of the rest. I guess. I was able to. I I know for certain. I was, but, but that was the. <laughs> that he was, was the, the number one guy one. in the country. Yeah, he had a winner's senior. The best guy in the country. It was. It yeah. wasn't like you ran into some no, like ah, yeah. oh, this guy was a good football player that which he did play football in the Big Twelve at Iowa State. Think right. he so you see, a little you bit. see, like you know, that was like I got my butt kicked, but that was the first time I had ever even um, been in a match with somebody of that caliber. I remember yeah. thinking, like, okay. There's there's still more work to be done. So, what's the progression like from a defeated freshman to a sophomore? You go from two fifteen to heavyweight, right? Dude, I uh, so I just I I I just yeah, I went to heavyweight, um, and uh, 
So one of my one of my good friends, he's flip flop because he was a heavyweight uh, our freshman year, and he went or yeah, he was heavyweight slash two fifteen. He goes down to two fifteen. I go to heavyweight, and uh, I uh, I I was a, I was better, a lot better. I think I. I think I cracked for sure 20, 25 wins that year. I went from none to like 20, 25 maybe. It had to that, be. That's, that's incredible. You understand that, right? Yeah, yeah. It was like 20, 25. And I just, I just started figuring out that um, you had to be a lot more aggressive. You had to, uh, you, had to uh, you know, stay diligent. Again, with the with – the, and my thing was lifting. I couldn't bridge the skill gap. Um, and I had a really good um, heavyweight coach. At the time, uh, Dave Blankenship, even my head coach was good. But we worked on – we had, like, three or four moves, which is kind of what I did in college. Three or four moves that I could do, that I could drill, that were lights out, that we knew at any point if you had to pull this out of, you know, your hat, you could do this. And that was kind of what carried me. I, like I said, the skill set of setups and, you know, doing this. You know, I didn't have that as, as a sophomore, but I had what he gave me in. And I was like, all right, we can do this over and over and over. And it worked until it didn't. And then, you know, that's just, you know, I bridged the gap with athleticism and size and strength. I came at the next year. And next year, I probably underachieved at the very time. As, as a junior. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I had five or six losses, and I shouldn't even lost the last semester. I mean, going into the districts, I think I had three losses. Um, you know, but that was my first trip to – districts and for like I said my high school wasn't really uh <coughs> well it wasn't really a, a powerhouse of wrestling so no one had been you know we, we didn't know what we were doing you know it was dude we're going to this thing called districts like what is this district that we're down right back was that the Firestone <laughs> district no we were at uh you were D1 weren't you Perry Maslin Perry, Perry. we were at Perry yeah yeah that's a tough district that's a tough district, yeah, that's a tough like, district. yeah I'm like I'm at this thing called districts I'm seeing you know these guys from different parts of Ohio, I'm like, wait a second, what's going on? Like, have you been here? And then you win a match and the rest of my teammates get slaughtered. And like, <laughs> you're the only one left. I'm like, wait a second, I don't know if I want to be the only one left. Like, what's going on? You know, and that, that's got, I should have, I probably should have got out that year too. I just, I, my, my heart wasn't in that year. So your junior year, you make it to the district. How far, how do you do in the district as a junior in high school? Uh, around, around the place. I lost. Oh, the, so, lost so did you lose yeah. in the county semi? Yeah, I should have. I should have. I'd lost like three to two. And then did you take fifth or sixth? Uh, or no, it would have been round before that. I'm sorry. So it was around before the because the Conti guy quarters, who, Conti quarters, yeah, Conti quarters. The guy who beat me, he uh, took fifth. I think. Got it. Got and it. And I had beat him twice earlier that year. It was something stupid. I just my heart to, wasn't in it. To a degree, you underachieved. But here's the thing. I don't think we think about it. I don't think you think about this. I don't. I, I know I think about it because I'm pretty <laughs> conscious of it. Okay. Dude, it's the hardest thing you can do. Yeah. You cannot go do anything harder yeah. than high school wrestling. Yeah. Unless That's you're awesome. like, hey, I'm training to climb Everest, and then I'm going to climb K2. And yes. Unless you're no, doing it, things it, like that. It was the hardest. It was the hardest – and I and I tell people that a, 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 a lot. Like you know, wrestlers are just wired differently, and it's just it's just different, man. You go through that, and you see where it's real introspective because you have a lot of moments that you have to sit back and remember, like, all right, what just happened? All right, or yeah. what am I going to do to get myself ready for this match to go out there? And those aren't skills. I, I didn't have those skills before. I had to learn how to use those skills because, you know, I, I didn't have any – I didn't have a reference. I didn't have a yeah. – nobody I knew wrestled. I was, the only dude, I was the only person I knew that wrestled, you know. And, and then actually started getting some success. No, I, I had no idea. I had no one to ask. Well, it's wild, too, because you're this guy who's a, in the band. Mm -hmm. You know, you see, you see someone get trucked. And, and yeah. of the Akron public schools – Firestone's the yeah. nicest one, right? Yes. Yes. It's the, it's the nicest one, right? So it's yeah. not like you went to, like, some people would think that Firestone's an inner city school. No, no. It was it's not. It's, isn't it a magnet yeah. school? It's the best academic school of the Akron Public, isn't it? Yeah. The, the International Baccarat back Program, and it was a performing arts school. Yeah. So it's a really good school. So it's not like you were at, like, Collinwood or Shaw. No. no. I mean, those are tough schools. Right? No, I was, uh, you know, no, I had to. Not Glenville. 
Yeah, no. I had to audition to get in Firestone. That's what's wild about it. You're you're this performing arts guy. <laughs> exactly. You're not exactly. you're not an athlete. You're not an athlete. Like sports? Like what are, you, what are you talking about? I'm not playing sports. I'm going to going going to a conservatory of music, you know. It's so know. wild. It's wild to think <laughs> about it. Here's the other thing, Jermail. Yeah. Even like how I was like, Anderson, this guy, no, he ain't the guy. You're like, and he dude, he had your back. Jim Anderson. First off, people love him or hate him. You already know that. Yeah, oh yeah. But oh, to yeah. talk about Jimmy, if you're one of Jimmy's guys, right? Give me a land for traffic for you, and he's got your back. Right. And right. you were that to him if you didn't know that. Right. No, yeah. It, he was I, riding I, uh, for you, dude. He was in. He was all in on you, man. He was all <laughs> in on you when I'm, I'm. I was screaming at him in the concourse. Yeah. I was like, that guy is not going to be any good. And if you kind of know, if you kind of know Jimmy, he gets his mind set on something, like you could see it, like you know. And, and talking to coaches and during that recruitment process, he was the only one that was kind of like, like I could, if it was like a his verbal, like he was rubbing his hands, like look what, what I found. And I, you know, I just was like, well, you know, I'd like to go to Canada, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, you know. And it's just like I think he knew. I didn't know, or my parents knew what he knew. He just had to – I just, just didn't have to quit. Like, if I could still continue the growth that I made in high school into college, I think he saw that. And uh, and that was probably uh, probably why he was, like, kind of rubbing his hands. Like, I, if he does what he can in high school and bridge that gap in two or three years, you know, he might – he actually might be something, you know. And I think that's probably, what, what looking back, what he was thinking. What changed from your junior year to your senior year to go from being a district not placer, a district blood round guy, essentially, yeah, right? Blood, uh, yeah. Um, what changed from being a district, not a, not even a district player, a district qualifier, let's just say that. What changed from then junior year high school to senior year high school at Firestone and making the state finals? What changed for you? Um, I would probably say – uh it was get a job or work out those are my options and i really wanted i wanted really really good next year i was kind of like on a revenge tour i think that last year of high school um i was kind of on a revenge tour and the wrestling was at the top of my list but i have a number of other uh social accolades i wanted to i wanted to accomplish too so i was on a bench tour so i was i went i went zero dark 30 in the in the in the Porter household basement, and I was training, and I was running heels, and I was carrying um, we had mats, unused mats in the in the wrestling room, and I was carry those up the stairs. I'd run stairs with mats rolled up on my back, you know, I'd roll them up and carry them like that. Like I was shoot, doing everything like shoot from Vision Quest. Basically, like shoot. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, so basically, like shoot. I, that's kind of probably where I got the idea. We had the you know, if you've been to D two districts back in the day, it was a pretty big auditorium. So I'd be there, no lights on. I'd be running up and down. By my, I mean, we didn't have the iPods, and the, you know, it was just me breathing and running up and down. But I know um, my first. I went basically undefeated until I ran to Tony. Did you, were you year. undefeated as a senior going to the? State I had a, I had a, I had an injury default in the in the D's. I had a partial tear in my meniscus, so I guess if you count that as a blemish. But uh, other than that, no one beat me. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't lose a, I didn't lose a single match that I ran to Tony. Um, and that was like 40 something wins. And so that's why I knew, like, you know, and even you see me like, oh, it's got nothing, you know, it's got, but just to bridge that gap from being a junior to senior, you know, it was like, I had to, I cranked in the high, in the high gear. And that was kind of how it happened. So yeah, you make the finals against you. When did he pin you in the second? He might pin the first round, dude. I think he pinned me in the first round. First period. Yeah, for, first period. I'm sorry. Yeah, first. first, off, first. Tony Johnson's a total freak. He's yeah. still smashing Polish dudes' faces and Russian dudes' faces. Yeah, I mean he had <laughs> overseas. Had, dude, he had he had um a number of high level wins from the standpoint of Fargo, from the standpoint of just you know tournament. I mean he was seasoned, and I think He's a the lot number of that, one guy in the country. Yeah. and then you have me. I'm just <laughs> I'm a, I'm just a dude from Akron Firestone. No one heard of Akron Firestone. Here I come, all, all, all like, uh, all right, guys, here we go. We're going to take a couple easy shots. And he comes out like a bull in a china shop. And I just remember that. I'm like, I am not prepared for this right now. 
Well, because you weren't. Because you weren't. I was not. No. Because you didn't no, go to the Ironman. You you, no. How far is Firestone from Walsh Jesuit High School? How far is Akron Firestone from Walsh Jesuit? Not far at all. Ten minutes at most. At most. At easily. At most. Yeah. I mean, that might have prepared you. Because no. no, I would have seen something like that of that caliber before. Whoever was there in that in that in that year, I would at least had had saw um something and got my feet wet, you know. But by the time I got to the state finals, I was like, this is he's real, he's way faster than I am. This is way too fast, you know. And but you know, so I I adjusted and you know that kind of stuff later on. But yeah, I remember thinking that. So, you're a finalist, state mm-hmm. finalist in Ohio in Division One, the big division. Mm-hmm. Now it's time to go off to Kent. Yeah. Um, how brutally honest was was the coaching staff with you about the things you needed to develop? Oh. <laughs> extremely honest extremely honest uh you know um but it was good because it's 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 i respond to that i respond if you shoot me straight you know um they were really honest and i remember basically the stipulation because remember i came in tomas was coming back off the acl injury i came in with dave noga willie was still there and it was me you know oh my god you were the you were the fourth guy I was the fourth guy, and I think there was someone else that was even te- – remember Hiller was teeter-tottering between 97 and heavyweight. And he was so a Juco was- All-American, right? Right. So it was like it, – it was five guys basically vying for one position. Um, and, you know, and, and so it was no – it was not unknown to anybody that, hey, man, you know, you, you, if, you, if, you, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you, know, you don't, but you have to earn it, you know. So I, I wasn't – I wasn't – in the dark about that. I knew I had to beat beat everybody or beat someone to get to that spot and do what I could. And you know, and that's kind of so I knew that. I like the challenge. So So did you redshirt as a true freshman then? I redshirted, yeah. So you redshirt. Uh-huh. Um Tomas won the Mac when I was a senior, so two thousand three. I don't think he won the Mac again. No, he didn't. He might have qualified again though. Uh yeah. I think he might have qualified again. So, yeah, so that- it was him and it was him and Camargo that registered that two thousand and five six year I think two yeah. five yeah two thousand four two thousand five I think it was him and Camargo and went I think Tomas went like two and two again or no he maybe did I can't I can't remember I know Alex went back to back I thought Alex got beaten around the twelve by Clint Weidenberg the yeah, uh, that, that, Cornell that, guy yeah yeah we had to refresh in the dorm I remember watching that but yeah Tomas went and Tomas lost to Stouffer, who was all American that year, that's who beat him in the mat. Central Michigan guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrestled Stouffer. Did you? Yeah, Stouffer beat me three to two. Yeah, he was a ninety-seven he pound. Like three to two. <laughs> yeah, he beat me three to two. But he was a transfer from Grand Valley State, really? which was like a club team in Michigan, and he transferred in. Oh. Yeah, I lost him three to two, and I was like, "How am I losing to this guy?" Well, he's good, but <laughs> that's just how it goes. I mean, Central, he just does a great job there. And right. you know that was that was a great rivalry for you guys. You guys in Central went back and forth as far as the duels. They always won the tournament, but that was a great. Yeah. You guys beat them, and Jim won his first MAC title as the yep. head coach of Kent State. When you you actually beat Gerard Trice in at Central Michigan in McGuirk Arena, right? Yes, Rose Arena. Is it Rose Arena or McGuirk? Yeah, it was yeah. Rose Arena. Rose Arena. Okay, yeah. so you beat him for you guys to win a MAC title. You beat. Multiple time yeah. All American Gerard Trice, right? Yeah, it came out of overtime that match. Did you take him down? Yep. Double leg? Uh, yes. <laughs> I remember it. I yes, remember it because Ty leg. Linder called it. Ty Linder called yeah. it. He probably voiceover called it, but he yeah. was pumped. He was pumped. I've seen that. Yeah. I think it I have was, a DVD uh, of it or something. That's funny. Yeah, it was a uh, double leg. That's what it was. Yeah. That's, that, sealed, that sealed the deal. What was the progression at Kent State for you, Jermail, as far as you came in? Did you give up instruments? Did you give up string instruments? Yeah, dude. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I had – I was around the culture of wrestlers that I missed in high school. So, so coming to college and being around the culture 
it was like I was able to fast track and understand the sport better. Just I felt, I, like I said, Kent, I felt right at home. That was one of the reasons why I really, I really liked going there. But, you know, it was just, it was, I was able to immerse myself. Yeah, I, instruments went to the wayside um, at that point. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it, the progression was um, the summers again. It was the summers. You know, we, we worked pretty hard during, during um, the season. But that was where we could branch, we could branch off because, you know, we could do nothing for three or four months and wrestle a little bit here and there and work out here and there, or you could do it every day. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the difference of kind of training in the off season was going to get you that further, that much further ahead during the season. And that's kind of the lesson that carried over. So talk about red shirt year to freshman year to sophomore year. How many times did you qualify for the NCAs? Oh, uh, three. Three. Yep. What did you take in the MAC the year you qualified the first time as sophomore year? Um, I took second. Second. Who did you lose to? Gritter. Bubba Gritter. Yeah, Gritter. 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 Gritter beat me twice. So Gritter twice. Beat- I took second. I took second sophomore and junior to Gritter. I took second as a freshman to the dude from Buffalo. I forget his name. Dude, dude, dude. Willie beat Willie. Never lets me. He never lets me live that down. That Willie beat him early in the season, and he and he played with me in the MAC finals as a freshman. We were at Northern Illinois. Tremel, you got played out in the MAC finals. I got played out in the in in this, the MAC. This finals. podcast might be over. <laughs> <laughs> he 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 played with me in the MAC. The most. Uh, it was the and here's the thing. Uh, I think I. I majored Gritter in the semis. I go from – so, at this point, I'm thinking <laughs> – I'm thinking I got the tournament wrapped up. I just majored the number one seed. I, I, I majored the season. No, so I'm going in and taking on – you know, I think he was a three seed. He wasn't even, like, whatever he was. And he slayed me. He <laughs> you. Dear God. And I know at that point, Jimmy wanted to just jump off a bridge at that point. Oh, I told oh my Gritter, God. Like, like, you had a champ at heavyweight for sure. I thought I was going to win. And he just snuck the boots in, and then the next thing you know, I'm flipping over. He's got me. How did how did he do this? Oh, yeah, he split with me. I remember that very very painful lesson there, but I learned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was a zero time All American, the zero time NCAA qualifier. So, me laughing at you probably is pretty. No, dude, I'm laughing at myself. Inappropriate. I, I have been, I have. Been, brought that memory up in like a decade i like if you ask me how i went in mac finals i can say you know i lost the gritter you know i beat i won as a senior but that freshman one yeah i got splayed by like a who beat seat. you or who'd you beat as a senior trice i that, that was a rematch you, you you beat him you beat him in the duel and then you beat him yeah and, I, and then I, he I, did I, not I, all I american and you did right what's that he did not all american and you did yeah so he lost to the the pit kid in the blood round Zach Schaefer? Schaefer. He lost to Schaefer in the blood round because he made it pretty far. He was going to All-American that year, too. It was tough. But yeah. Schaefer oh, yeah. Dr- I think he's a three-time All-American. Yeah, he, he would have been a four-time. If he beat Schaefer, he would have been a four-time. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, he was tough. I think I remember watching that match um, in the, uh, in the uh, tunnel, and that was an overtime match to, to, for him to win. Really? Yeah, I remember that. Wow. It was close. They wrestled kind of like. If you saw both of those guys now, you guys have gone the different direction. You continued to grow and get massive. Those guys, Schaefer might be 200 pounds now. Oh, I think really? Gerard fights at 205. Oh, yeah. He's doing, the, um, he's doing MMA too also. Bellator, he? I want to say. Okay. But I want to yeah. say he's 205. Wow. That's that crazy. sounds right. So is he still the dough boy or no? I, not at 205 pounds, I don't think he's a dough boy. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's probably like ripped up and smashing people's faces. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if he's called himself dough boy anymore. You know? No, I don't think if you're I, guy, man, I want to say, I don't know. We'll fact check it. We'll fact check it on the run. <laughs> check that one. Let me know. We'll have to fact check that one. I, I, I think he's 205, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I've seen him and he looks real good. Schaefer is a coach at Drexel, and he looks he he looks two hundred pounds, man. Wow. They look like different human beings. Wow, 
That's crazy. You are literally almost twice both of their sizes. It, almost, yeah. <laughs> almost. <laughs> am I making that up? No, no. I literally, I, I literally am. Yeah. Literally you, am. You know what's not fair about you? You have abs. I hate your guts. I have abs at about 340. Right now, I don't have abs. But if I get to about 340, I got abs. That's not fair. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the, the that's the uh that's that's the thing about us us giant folk. When we get when we get big, when we get when we get big. <laughs> can you see the big, top two? Can you see the top two or can you see the top two right now? No, I got no dude, we, dude, we're coming off of like quarantine and holidays and like that. I'm just now January, I started back getting back to it. So I'm about like seven, eight weeks in, disciplined. Uh, I, I, and about another 16, I think I'll be, I'll be back down there. I, I take so, it slow and steady. But you will. I mean, I'm sure you'll shoot me a picture and be like, here oh, you yeah, go. Here you go, Zeb. We're, we're let off the leash in the summertime. You're going to see a lot of it. Don't you worry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Dude, you posted a picture, a video of like a lady on the street this summer what was that video? Some lady on the street doing something. It was a crazy video. I think a guy was begging you for money. What was uh-huh. the video? I think you might have had your shirt off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was that video? It made my day. I was like, this was, is awesome. It was, I, was wait, I was having some work done to my car, and it was hot that day, and I, I grabbed a coffee. And that's all I had to drink at the time. So I was sitting on like the outside, like outside area with my shirt off because it was real hot, drinking a coffee. And I had snapped a selfie, and the selfie was a lady coming up to me to, uh, in the unbeknownst to me, she enters the frame, and then she's asking me for money. So if you look at the picture, you can see her. She's like pointing her finger at me, like to ask me, "Excuse me, sir." And I was like, this is like the perfect time because it was it was hilarious. Because I was sweating my ass off drinking coffee in like 90 degree day. And here comes this, this chick all over nowhere just asking for money. Why would she approach of all people you? Dude, I was uh <laughs> I was on the main road, so oh. they, they're not they're not scared over there, man. <laughs> they're not, they're not you must have such a positive aura about you. It was daytime. <sighs> daytime i love everything about it (laughs) i love it okay walk me through the 2009 ncaa tournament round one round two quarterfinals walk me through those three matches oh um i think the first kid was against first what seed were you what seed were you you know what i do not remember i was top four though oh you were top four four? yeah because i think i was ranked four, four coming in I was top four, top four, top four, top five, maybe. I, I wasn't lower than that. I know that. Because the year before, I was like nine coming in. Got it. Before I was in the seat. So, I was like so, top so, four. So, who do you have in round one? Do you remember? Kid from Ryder. Ryder University. Don't tell Badland. Don't tell yeah. Badland. <laughs> Some kid from Ryder University, I think. You beat a Ryder, dude. Yeah. It you was beat him like, up? Good. Did you yeah, own him? Like a, yeah, it was like a major. Ten, ten something. It was a good warrant match. I remember Jimmy was pushing to go out there and and and, and shoot a lot because you know it would have been like me having a lot of downtime had I not. So I he wanted to go out there. And then, no, that Jimmy it was Hill. Hill was pushing to shoot, 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 shoot. No, because it was one of those matches. I wasn't in danger of losing. Um, the next round was uh, Dobies from Carolina, North Carolina. And I pinned him, so that was a quick match. I think they made me run sprints after that match. Actually, now I think about it. Garfield um, Heights guy. Garfield Heights guy. Um, the third would have been that put me in the quarters now. Zach Ray. Zach Ray, yeah. So that's the Zach Ray match. So that OT? Is, was that OT? No, that was regulation. That was a regulation. I uh because I was down. I thought I was down because I had the score to go up by one. So you take him down and ride him out? I take him down and that whistle blows. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was I it was like either 10 or 12 seconds left. I just kind of body lock, body lock him down, and I and we kind of scramble and I get on top, and then that was it. I think he was up. We'd wrestled earlier at Virginia Duels, and it was an overtime that match overtime match that I won. But 
that one, he was up, I'm pretty sure. I, I had to take – because the takedown wins. Because otherwise, knowing me, I would have probably just been like, all right, we're going to overtime, whatever. But I think I had to score to win. Wow. So you yeah, beat I, I did an not, NCAA champ. You beat an NCAA champ, which he wasn't an NCAA champ yet. Right. But you beat an NCAA right. champ to All-American. Right. Yes. All right. It's so then – What is the – what is the – so it's Alice in the semis. Yes. Now we're back to 2004, Jamal, of, well, has anybody been here? Like, besides uh, Josh and time. It's like, now you're in this big moment. Here you are. And it's like, okay, you're on a big stage. Now you have to go wrestle. And if you have, if I have any regrets in a career of wrestling, it's probably that match. Um, and I think uh, I did not wrestle good at all that match. I think I just, I just have enough experience of being focused and not letting the moment take you out of your game plan. And that's probably one of the big, it was like, it was, I was outmanned versus Tony Johnson in the state semifinals. I was not outmanned in this match. I just got, I was not ready to go. Winnable match. Absolutely. Winnable Absolutely. match. I, I, it's close. I, I got a takedown and escape. I think he got takedown, writing time, and escape. That was the match. And he won it that year, too. He won it versus the guy who I majored at the Southern Scuffle from Duke. Dudziak. Yeah. He beats wow. him like in a in like a one two point match. And I and I majored him in the semis the scuffle. It wasn't even the final. I majored him in the semis. I didn't know he was. That is wild. Wow. Yeah, so that's one of those things that I wish I could go back and get that match back. Um but uh but yeah, that's how that one goes. And it's just like, oh, that's like that was a dagger because I was like I was, I was, I knew I was better than that. So, at that point, it's Conti semis. You run into Rochelle. Yeah, I don't remember that match honestly. I was, uh, I was, uh, I had. You were ready for spring break. Yeah, I was ready for spring break, and that Rochelle match was like I had lost so much steam because, uh, stupidly, I would never tell any athlete at this point. You're like, well, what am I doing this for now? You know, you just kind of like, look, I'm out here wrestling. Because the 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 shot to be in the finals, like I don't, at my mind at the time, I was like, you know, I don't get anything out of going for third place. You know, I was, you know, getting third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. At this point, <clears throat> in my mind, I was like, well, you know, the mission's accomplished. I was all American. All right, you know, I don't remember that match. The match I do remember and I did try real hard was the next match. Fifth and sixth. <clears throat> when I was I was I was against Jabriskie, and I remember I tried hard for that match because he beat me for the round of twelve the year before. Oh, you were in the blood round the year before, and Zabriskie beat you. Yeah, riding time. Oh my God, are you serious? Four seconds, four seconds of all it was. He won it too, dude. Mm-hmm. You ran into a bunch. Of, you ran into. You wrestled three NCAA champs. Right. <laughs> right. As a dude, he just started wrestling six years before that you know that is ins- that is we call that a meteoric rise do you understand yeah. that yeah you were exactly. not wrestling you started wrestling in 2001 <laughs> or two 2001 i was a freshman eight years eight yeah. years you're knocking down barriers for kent state they hadn't yeah. had an all-american since 87 or 86 86 Don Horning. The ball stopped at 86. That was it. That 86 wall, Don wall. Horning. Yep. And then all of a sudden, you 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 burst on the team the scene 23 right. years later. Not And there wasn't just you, but you were the first one to do it. You did it in the morning. Bailey, I went one at, or a place, or he uh, secured a uh, placing that evening. Yeah, that evening he beat the Theo dude from uh, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. North Idaho guy. Yeah. That's crazy. That was a good match, too. So you get two All Americans. You have two All Americans in one year. You hadn't had one in twenty three. Well, I had one twenty in twenty three. But we were, we were, uh, we were on a on a mission. I think we had a pretty good class of top talent that year. But we were on a mission, so so to speak, because um, I think we were just tired of being uh, um, mediocre. And if anything, you know, the addition of Kilgore to the lineup, um, it, it 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 made everybody kind of raise their level a little bit, you know. Absolutely. How about this? 
Mitch, if loses a match, he shouldn't lose in the round of 12. Uh, right. and Mitch, three uh, All-Americans. That Going to that NCAA should have been – yeah, we should have had four. Remember, Kilgore lost a stupid match too. Kilgore was like the five seed. Yeah. Kilgore was the five seed. He should have should have placed that year. You're right. I agree. Wow, you should have had four All-Americans. And then the thing about it is, wow, you can't speculate that. You don't know. Well, both of them are All-Americans the next year. And eventual national champ. Yeah, and one was an NCAA champ. So, <laughs> an eventual, an eventual. Uh, national so champ. I will, I will speculate that. Yeah, yeah. Mitchell, Mitchell would all American, and then and he then we had last blood year, round. Who last year runs into Molinero? Yo, Molinero! Yeah, you should have had five all Americans. Last yeah. year he gets banana splitted by Molinero and loses a yeah. like eight six match. Exactly. So it's kind of oh like oh my god, you guys would have been in the top ten. Yes, yes. So coming into that weekend, the expectation, the bar was set high. It was about who was going to do it first. I remember thinking, I mean, you know, I, I figured Kilgore had a good shot that because he was a five C, and technically because he was at eighty four, I was a heavyweight. He could potentially do it first if I didn't lose. So I didn't lose until the semis. I was like, yeah. all right, I'd be first. Yeah, no, you were you were the first. Yep, I always team. tell people that I'm like this guy. It was it was high stakes that that weekend was high stakes. So those bragging rights. How good was spring break? Um, no, it was not that good because it rained like the day after we got there, but it was cool though. Uh, uh, it was a good time if I remember correctly. <laughs> Did you run into anybody? Did you run into like Mark Ellis or oh. anybody? Dude, because all those guys were there. So, yeah, I did run to Ellis. I ran to Ellis. You ran into Mark Ellis? I was kidding. I ran to Ellis on the beach. And um, I don't think you can talk about wrestling. I think it was just like, yeah, man, that was a crazy match. Yeah. It was cool, and, though, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, he's cool. It's cool, so dude. Guy, the guy who beat you in the NCAA semifinal. Yeah. You run yeah. into him at Panama? Yeah. Was Panama or Daytona Beach? It was Panama. Panama City. Wow. And I'm like, hey, man. You know, good match. Yeah, good match. Yeah, that's awesome. Sweet, <laughs> that's awesome. Wow, enjoy, what a here you go. Enjoy your enjoy your enjoy, enjoy your vacation, your spring break. You too. You're the champ. You too. You're the champ. Yeah. I took six. Yeah, yeah whatever. I, t- I took a, I took a lousy six. You're the champ. I took a lousy six. To the champ. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like getting you know getting you know slaying the beast? What's it like? You take. Zach Ray down in the last seconds of the match and you, and you do it. And it was like, there was all this pressure to get Kent state. It was the graveyard of guys and yeah. you know, Cleveland state's trying to do it. Now Buffalo's trying to do it. Now all these programs in the Mac are trying to do it now. And, and it's just so tough, man, you know, Eastern Michigan did it and then they dropped their program. It's just right. like, right. it is, and, you know, and they did it. They had a 20 year drought, man. It was, you know, 19 year drought. What's it like to be the guy? What was it like? Um, it was, you know what? Because being in the room at the time and where we were, um, it was all we heard every year. And I guess I was bring up to the point of not knocking any of the classes before me or us, but to remember correctly, we lost to Ashland. <laughs> we lost to, you know, always we were getting, you know, um, Pitt Johnstown giving us a run from so it was just like being a laughing stack kind of like you guys are supposed to be division one and then when you I, I, the kudos to Jimmy and Josh at the time were the he they picked the guys so we had a pretty good recruiting class we had a layer of guys who were decorated as far as state titles and accolades and then we had the second layer of guys that were like on the cusp but had potential I think that's a lot of times when you're coaching the mid-majors like that, it's an eye for the potential. We're not going to have guys that's going to be day one starters. But in a year or two, these guys are be really good. I think that's what we saw with the Lashaways, the Chines, the guys like gonna that. I was going to say Eric Chine. I think you're a one-time state placer. Yeah. A guy like you, one-time state placer. I think sure. Jimmy makes his money off of the Eric Chines and the yeah. Jermail Porters of the world. Yeah. 
I mean, those guys, I mean, we were able to, even China that year, he bumps it to 97. He bumps and makes it to the NCAA tournament. Too. I think he was run to 12 or something. Right. He was run to 12 also. That's wild, man. That's, well, that's he had a team. Right. Woo. That was a literal squad of guys that came in there. And from freshmen all the seniors, we were just like, we were the guys that were the second tier. But we didn't give up. And we worked hard. And by the time we were seniors, that's when you saw sort of like, oh, these guys are pretty good. And that's kind of like when you're in the mid-majors, you look for the potential guys. You're not going to get – I mean, you land a Kilgore, which they did. That's guy coming in day one. And he's like, oh, well, you know, he's 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 murking everybody. <laughs> but at the time, I wasn't that guy. Like I guess I just got destroyed <laughs> in the state finals. I'm just like, I'm okay sitting for a year and – eating ramen noodles in the dorm and just kind of learning how to wrestle again, like, or learning how to wrestle. I, I'm, I'm not ready. I am not ready to go. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, and, that, and, and that's kind of how, how, how it works. So kudos uh, to those guys. I'm seeing that sort of eye for talent. Wow. What an experience, yeah. man. What a, what a, what a gump life you've had. <laughs> yeah. I can train people every day. What's that like? First off, what's the name of your business? Uh, functional fitness, applied strength and conditioning. Can I see the shirt again? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It says FFASC. Let me see. FFASC. That's what it stands for. Functional fitness, applied strength and conditioning. That was when I, that was when I started my second life because there was no way I was going into an office, so to speak. <laughs> so I was like, well, guess we'll go get some uh, certifications and some continued education and we'll kind of go, go with, go with that. And that's what I did. And what do your parents do? My mom's an administrator for Echo Public Schools, and my dad is a uh, surgical tech in uh, urology at the Cleveland Clinic. So how much did your parents stress education to you? Not a lot. Well, they stressed it, but I just – I don't think that was my area of um, expertise. Uh, they they – they knew that was that didn't hold my interest a lot. I've always been a creative. That's why I was really into music because I'm a creative. Like, you put me in a box. I hate being in a box. I like to be able to kind of do things on my own terms, and I kind of can like be free to create and make things as I see see fit. Um, so it was just look, man, stay eligible, get decent grades, you know, and we'll go from there. Because I'm not, I don't think I ever got honor roll in middle in, in middle school. Definitely not high school. Um, uh oh, that loser there's up. No, we're good. We're um, good. Yeah, just just for a little bit. Um, I I I I I never kind of got those things, but um, yeah. Um, they were kind of like you know, just get decent grades, and I did. <laughs> and what what is your brother? What's his degree? Where did he go to school? He went to Cleveland State. And then what's the age difference between you and your brother? Uh, three years. He's thirty one. I'm thirty four. And did he go to Firestone as well? He did. And is he arts guy too? He was. What is his degree from Cleveland State? Uh, he has <clears throat> his master's in exercise science. Jeez, oh, Pete. Yeah. Do you have it? Are Are you the least educated porter? Uh, probably. <laughs> what is your undergrad in, Jermail? Uh, criminal justice. Dude, if you rolled up and got out of a cop car and pulled me over, I would be like, <laughs> is this real right now? Right. Uh, it's so crazy, man. Right. So That's wild sad. to think that you <laughs> could have been law enforcement. <laughs> hey, you know who's getting into it now? Who's that? Kilgore. No, really? Yeah, he's getting in. He's He's been attempting to get in. He's applying places and – Oh, trying boy. to get into a couple academies and that was his that was his major too actually yeah no I that's my it. point that's the whole point yeah, of bringing it up oh, you guys are both criminal justice majors from Kent State imagine imagine Kilgore pulling you over that's that's a funny one if you no over, oh. imagine you pulling you over yeah, Kilgore is of average size Kilgore's around six foot right, right 230 pounds you can see he's like a beefy guy or whatever sure, sure. you are a physically imposing individual Fair, fair enough. No, I mean, it's no, it's not debating. I'm not being silly. <laughs> You're a big dude. You played in the NFL yeah. for two seasons. It's not like I don't think I, it's not a stretch here. 
No. Am I not. reaching? Am I reaching? No, no. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's not a reach. That just wouldn't, again, that wouldn't be for me either. I thought about that too. Like, well, what are you going to do? You know, I, again, unbeknownst to me knowing about football, well, what are you going to do with this degree after you're done? I was like, you know, I, I didn't have an answer. I really did. I didn't, I didn't have an answer. So, so, wild so it worked out. And I was like, next level unlocks. Going to NFL. Next level unlock. <laughs> Next level unlock. We're going to the NFL. And now, Next and now level unlock. unlock. Hey, are you famous? Well, hold on. Let me tell you my story. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, yeah. lot of, uh, lot of ins, lot of outs to the story. I don't know. A lot of How much time you got? Yeah, How much exactly. time you got? You know, I played the, ba- I played the bass guitar in the, uh, the uh, high school orchestra. Yep. Yep. I don't know what to tell you, but uh, yeah. Oh, I played in the NFL. Sure. Oh, I was a Division One All American. Wait a minute. Okay, so maybe I got some famous. Yeah. <laughs> I, got some, I got a story, so that, that, that's for sure. I love it. I love it. Oh, I have one other thing I had to ask you. Okay. Last thing. Last thing I have for you. All right. After you're going to give all your uh, training information and contact information, but I wanted to ask you about the situation this summer in the United States of America with race relations. I wanted to ask you about what kicked it off. George Floyd is killed by Minneapolis police officers, right? And Mm -hmm. I always like to hear a perspective from African-Americans. And I want to hear, and I talked to Jaden Cox about it, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Mm -hmm. I think I sent you the interview, but when you see a situation like that happen and you see what's happening in America with, as far as division amongst whether it's racial, racial division, whether it is socioeconomic division, whether it's political division, whatever it is, what happened this summer in the United States of America? What were your thoughts on it? And, and, you know, black lives matter was a big part of a lot of the protests. I actually went to a BLM rally. I'm sure you're surprised (laughs) here in Trigger Falls. Um, and it was cool. It was actually really cool. Everybody was pretty low key. There was a couple thousand people there, and sure. you know me. I walked around, I was just talking to people, had a good time. <laughs> like yeah. you know, I like to hear what people have to say. I'm a First Amendment guy. You know, I'm a yeah, freedom yeah. guy. I'm a freedom guy, just like you. I really yeah, enjoy man. freedoms. But what is your take on race in America, division in America? Where are you at with it? Ooh, so um, here here is my my my, my take on what happened. It was from an outsider looking in. Because remember, we, I'm in Cleveland, so we had the whole um, the downtown riots also, you know, that followed a week later. It was, wasn't was even four weeks, it was six days later. Um, I, uh, I think it was a ticking time bomb. Um, and I think there was a lot of people that feel like they aren't heard and feel like it's not enough light being shed on the um, – the uh, reoccurring instances of police brutality. And I think um, um, Jane Cox, but he put a good point of being able to have a conversation where both ends are open as to why and understanding where both comes from. It's kind of funny because you put that criminal justice background as um, undergrad understanding um, how, um, you know, a lot of those professors are ex police officers. So they tell you stories of when they were on duty and when they were doing X, Y, and Z, and you kind of see it from their part, and then you see it from another part where someone really is um, being profiled and it's unsuspecting. I don't think people hear both sides. I don't think people understand both sides um, um, clearly. I think that the worst thing that could happen a lot of times is just um, kind of like – or the manifestation of, I'm sorry, is what happened this summer. And now it's kind of weird that like that kind of goes away and it's like, <clears throat> so did things improve or was that just an outburst, you know? And there's no continued conversation from either side now, you know? And it's kind of like, if this is continuing to be a issue, shouldn't this be still being perpetuated? Like what happened? What happened to everything? So I think there's not a continued dialogue as far as how we measure improvement. I know there is, they passed some sort of legislation, I think in Minnesota, they call them the um, George Floyd Law um, um, in Minnesota. 
So that's one thing, but that's not, I don't think that's, uh, you might have to correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that's everywhere. I think it was basically you can't use chokeholds, if I'm not mistaken. It's probably, um, I would assume, I don't know this. Once ago, we got to do some, we got to do some doughboy, doughboy fact checking. We yeah. got to do some, some state law. It's probably a state law is my guess. Yeah, though. I think that's, yeah, okay. State, yeah, I think that's what they passed. Um, so that's one thing that came out of it. But um, I think there's a lot of divisiveness. I think um, the powers that be prey on that. And if you prey on that divisiveness, this is what you get. And I think in actuality, it's not as divisive or it should not be as divisive as it's portrayed if you fuel a fire without um if you continue to fuel fire this is what's what happened but what about if you didn't fuel that fire and you didn't um um portray it in negative lights and actually try to um get some sort of resolution and some sort of um intelligent thought you know that's probably not as attractive to media outlets or to this and that it's not it's not it's not it doesn't sell you know what i'm saying and I think that's the problem now. Everybody's chasing, um, chasing that sort of like story as far as like, because I mean, look what happened. It was like weeks, weeks of um, protesting, and then you know, in some instances, rioting and this, that, and other. It's just kind of like I feel like that was fueled a lot, as opposed to. So, what can we do today as a result of this? Does anybody have anything intelligent or tangible to bring to the table? All right. These are your these are the things we can do. Let's see if we can get this done. You know what I'm saying? And it's just it, that that doesn't happen. Um, that doesn't happen these days. I think that's a lot of the problem is it's 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 just manipulation to a degree. I I, I would say that you know I think I think that um, there is a, a prevalence of police brutality. But on the same token, if something pops off at your house, you're gonna call 911. You're gonna want a police officer to show up. You're gonna want him to do his job. So you, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like you can't yeah. be like, yeah, yeah, you can't have it both ways. Can't defund the police, have, but then when you want them and you need them, they should be there, right? right? You can't, you, exactly. That's my, so you see like the divisiveness is fueled by a bigger machine. And that's, yes. and that's, and that's, and that's my, my recognition of it as far as like, you're taking that and you're perpetuating like victimization in, if that I kind of want to say. And it's like, wait a second, it doesn't have to be that way. You gotta look at it from both. You gotta look at it from that. Like, yes, there are, there's, there, there, there is profiling. Yes, there are these things that happens, and there are instances of, you know, you know, individuals or officers who are probably crooked or this, that, and other. But on the same token, if we take that away, then you are basically sheep, and, and you're waiting for the wolves to come to eat you. <laughs> so, unless you can protect yourself. And you can govern yourself, in which case most people cannot. So you, there has to be a common ground, and we should work towards a common ground of that uh, of that sort of understanding. I think that takes law enforcement talking to, you know, its community members, regardless of what community in, and then the same token of community members understanding that look, we're not here to just give you a hard time, but there are going to be bad apples in your community that we're going to try to eradicate to certain degrees and try to apprehend to make this community safer. We need both things, you know, we need both areas to help. And I think that's kind of the conversation needs to be had. Do you feel like you are marginalized? Do you feel like, do you ever feel like you are in fear of your life? Do you ever feel like um, someone's looking at you and looking down their nose at you or looking at you differently because you're African-American? Do you feel that at all? No. <laughs> Can I just tell no, you when I when I see you what what I want to do? We're an hour talking about the things I've done. At. No, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't. Um, I heard some um, um, different opinions on it, and it was just like I don't, I don't feel that way. Um, because I am not portrayed, and I don't portray myself that way. You see what I'm saying? You know, it, it, if if you view yourself as that way, then I can understand. But I don't view myself that way. I don't feel like I'm marginalized. I think I, I, I take every opportunity I can. I maximize the opportunity. I, I work from sun up to sun down and I, you know, and I do my best to be the best version of me and allow everything else to take care of it. And I'm not looking for anyone to provide me any sort of instant gratification from that. I go out there and I get after it every day. And I think from that, you're rewarded in that sort of scheme. You know what I'm saying? It's not instant. It's not going to happen like that, but 
you know, and as far as that goes, as far as portrayal of what people think of me or this thing, you know, if they don't tell me that. <laughs> well, when I see you, here's my thoughts. When I see you, I'm like, first off, I'm going to talk trash to him. Second <laughs> off, I want to give him a big gigantic hug because the guy made my college wrestling program not a joke anymore. Sure. Thirdly, this dude's just a great person. I love this guy. I love talking to him. He's an amazing person. I, I, I just, definitely appreciate it. Though. But I don't like look at you like I'm not like uh, I, don't, I don't get like this. Oh man, I I don't want to marginalize or mistreat Jermail. I I don't think of you that way. I think no. of like this guy is first off, he's done it all. He's done it all, sure. but you'd never know it talking to him. Sure. Right. We're sure. talking in a media format. You understand that I'm I'm asking you this information. And it provides content and gives people context to who you are. Right. I already know all this, right? Like I knew this. We've had these conversations before. Right. We've hung out, we drink beers, right. we hang out. But my thing is like, you know, someone like me, I always want to be self-reflective and be better. What, what can we, what can someone like me do to be better? What do you think of that? I want to be better. What can I do to be better? I, I somebody asked me a question. One of my, one of my good friends asked a question that, in May when, you know, things were kind of tumultuous. And I said the same thing that someone told me, if you yourself want to help as far as you being better and contribute and be something impactful in his position, I said, you could be a mentor. And here's what I meant because my first business partner was my mentor, business mentor, you know, coaches are mentor, but as far as the world of business, um, he was an older Caucasian gentleman in his late 60s at this during that time. And he basically taught me everything I knew about this business, right? And he didn't have to, but it was investing in a person that ultimately would go on to then open his own facility. And I told my friend that I was like, you are, you're, he's in sales or he's hit the sales job. Like you get the opportunity, take someone at an entry level that's, entering the same job food as you and if they're african-american or you know if that's the case mentor that person and tell them everything you know because then if you've taught them everything you know you are essentially giving them um a pathway to be successful because there's no there's no hidden um boxes there's no, no there's no there's no um there's no things that they're left in the dark if you touch it you give them every opportunity to sees and be great um then you've done something because if that's the disparity we're looking at from a social social economic standpoint from a community standpoint all right teach them everything you know and with that hopefully they go teach someone else everything you know and that's that's the most impactful way to uh to uh make a make a change you know hashtags are cool but what can you say tangibly you've done? And I, and I always use that as example of that's how you make an impact in someone's life because then they're going to be able to do that and pay it forward to someone else. I feel like that, that, you know, that's something I do pretty well to begin with. I am a teacher. I, you you know, I'm obviously constantly uh, passing knowledge on to people. There you go. I think the biggest thing, and this is just me being self-reflective to you, mm -hmm. I think teaching my sons to treat others with respect no matter what and accept people if they have disabilities sure. different different ethnicities i think that me doing my part with my sons is a really big part of it um, i you so, know my nieces my <laughs> nephews and and just show them and, and and just be who i am you know who i am you know that type of sure. stuff absolutely i help anyone right like absolutely. i feel like being me and just continue just be me Keep me and, and literally keep like literally you just said something i try and mentor and help people in any way shape and form i can and that's like that helps the, name of the game that helps that's that's doing something people ask that and that's literally that's what i'm saying so and zeb you checked all the boxes already but a lot of times people come with literally a blank question that have checked zero boxes but i don't know what to do well that's something you could do a lot of times and most cases that cost zero dollars you know, you know what I'm saying? You know, you know, that's, that's literally cost zero dollars. So I was pulling out a shirt, uh, the, uh, uh, took my kids sledding. We, we were pulling out and I have a big stupid truck 
<laughs> I love it. Great truck. Love it. F-150. Okay. Best truck. You could actually fit in it. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Great truck. Um, and I'm pulling out and we just got done sledding and I can park the truck and you know, there's a foot and a half of snow on the ground. We're at South Chagrin, um, Bentleyville, Chagrin Falls area. You guys get a lot of snow out there. <laughs> you get a lot of snow. <laughs> Anyhow, um, as we're pulling out this like Lexus, everybody with an SUV thinks they're invincible, yeah. right? Yeah. They pull down into the ditch and they're just stuck. Oh, so yeah. I have uh, toe straps with me and shackles, metal shackles. And I, the, the guy was an African-American. or anything. It was just a human in need, right? Right, right. But the, the point is um, I was undressing my kids into their sweats because they were sweats underneath their mm-hmm. – their snow gear and I put them in and I, I strap them both into their seats. And my one son is the oldest kid's like, dad, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm helping this guy. I'm going to pull this guy out. And he's like, why, why are you, why are you helping him? And pull the guy out. The guy's driving a Lexus, right? Lexus SUV. Long story short, I go, Hey buddy, we got to help people. You help people when you can help people. Right. Right. And it wasn't a situation where I was on the side of I-90 or Route 2. Right. And, and you're, someone's going to, you know, drive by and plow you, right? It wasn't yeah. like that. This is right. a situation where I could help somebody out. It was an extra, it was two, three minutes of my time. Exactly. Set the guy up, pulled him out of the ditch, unhooked him. Have a good day. My <laughs> kid had 50 questions. Do we help bad people? Do we help this person? Oh. Do we help that person? And that, my, my big thing was like, hey, we help everybody. Right. Do we help bad people, Dad? I said, you help them. You just help them once, though. Right. right. And I said, if you keep helping them, you know whose fault it is? Yours. Right? And, you know, yeah, like, a moment. That's good. There you go. That's just, a, you know, and it's just like a little thing like that, right? Um, I think that, that that's doing your part. Mm-hmm. And once again, it wasn't like the guy was a black guy. You know what I mean? But it was just yeah. it was human, right? I think yeah. like like you said, the powers that be are very focused yes. on ratings. Yes. And they're very focused on what sells. Yes. And the device of what sells and yeah. chaos and turmoil sells. And for sure. That's that's kind of where we <laughs> a lot of people fall in that, that easy trap. You know, How do so. I fix that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> hey, sub, make a billion dollars by a media company exactly. and um, have them yes. talk about puppies, kittens, and rainbows. There you go. There you yeah, go. oh, I got that one figured out too. Sweet. Yeah, I just all don't right. know all the answers, but I always want to be better. You know what I mean. <laughs> right? You know what I mean. Right, right, absolutely. All right, this is, you got anything else for me on race relations, Black Lives Matter, any of that, any, any, any of the division that occurred this summer and how we exist? You know, 13% of the population is African-American, you're African-American. You know, like, is there anything else you'd like to say about that? I want to, my thing is, another thing I can do is give, give, give you a voice. I think giving you a sure. voice. Because um, most of the time you're like, I'm angry, let's fight. And then, you know, <laughs> Or open, open, open my business back up, or let's fight. Like that's what a lot of your stuff is. Open my business, I'm good. I so here's the thing. My last thing is people ask me, and like I don't, I didn't, I, I never want to be viewed or portrayed as um a victim. I'm not a victim, um, and um, I don't feel helpless in today's society. And I think if you had access to um, individuals that probably have were like-minded in the African American community, they probably say the same thing. Like, I'm not, a, I'm not a victim. Like, as it's being portrayed as helpless, because um, that's not a positive light to prepare to prepare or to portray people. I'm sorry, that are in the same society as everyone else. You know, if you're just if you're looked at as victim, and then like you know, that's not a good thing. So I think. Um, a mindset change a lot of times has to take place as far as, you know, look, life isn't easy for anyone, you know, um, and we have to set that aside and figure out, okay, everyone's going to have challenges and we have to go through and we have to meet those challenges and conquer those challenges. But the idea of being victimized because of my race, I, I, I don't align with that. I think a lot of people, if they had the option to actually think for themselves 
for a second, but yeah, I'm not really, I'm not, I'm not a victim because that makes me, I'm helpless. And I'm not helpless because if I'm helpless, then I don't have a, I don't have a voice or say because I essentially, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of like, well, you could think for me because I can't do it. So I, 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 I don't necessarily align with those views. And I would say that's probably the biggest thing, mindset change um, and just uh, kind of looking at it as like, you know, I knew that, you know, I knew my life mattered. Uh, <laughs> I, I've always known my life mattered. I didn't need anyone to tell me that my life mattered. Um, and I think that I carry myself in the manner I work very hard. My parents work very hard. My brother works. I think we carry ourselves in that manner. It's like, look, I'm not a victim. My life matters. I go out and get it like everybody else. I just ask for an opportunity to um, to 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 show my skill set and be the best I can, and and I'll and I'll take it from there. And that's and that's it. That's no different than sports. That's no different than anything. Um, I, I, I think that's cut and dry. I think a lot of people, they had the same mentality. You know, you would hear less and less of those things from any race regardless. But, um, you know, I, I, so that's my take on that as far as that. You know, I stay in my little cubby hole until it affects me. And then I come out like a, like a, like a, like a wild bear. But, but oops, sorry about that. You're muted. You're muted. That's a, uh, I missed that last part. Can you repeat that um, last part, Jamal? Um, let's see what I say. I say, yeah, other than that, you know, I think that's pretty much that's pretty much it I'm saying that. I stay in my cubby hole, man. Unless you come for me or me or me or the business, I got uh I I, I got I got no beast of anybody. <laughs> okay. None whatsoever. So live and let live is what is what you're basically saying. Like as long as yeah, you man, everybody are coming part. at me, we're good. Yeah, do your part, dude. Do your job, like Belichick said, man. Does everybody do your job? We're 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 in a good shape. I love it. I love that part. Yeah. I, lo I love hearing that you were underneath yeah. that that maniac. Oh, uh, man, I love that, it. that number one rule: do your job. That's it. All you gotta do is do your job, and it takes care of itself. I think if we worried more about you know what we're doing than worrying about what others are doing, like what Belichick's saying, I think we'd be all in a better position. You know, we would, and it's real. It's real hard to worry about doing your job and being on a part of a team, not the star player. When you make it not about you and about everybody else, and like I'm contributing, it's very hard to just – so people have a very hard staying diligent in that lane. And I think that if more people viewed life as that, like, look, I'm just – I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not complicating it. I'm doing, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. And being the best at that will take care of itself. And it's real easy to but get bored and say, well, I'm going to do a little bit of this and do that. Or, I'm, you know, you, again, the distractions, the, the kind of like, you know. The instant gratification thing. society. Oh, man, that's horrible. Yeah, instant gratification. It's, We're, in a mess, a buddy. We're in a mess with that, right? Yeah. yeah it, 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 I it, mean, it, I don't think I got another two hours for you on that. I um, do, <laughs> but just I got to get to sleep tonight. But yeah. Jermail, how do people get trained by you? Where are you at? What's the information? How do we follow you on social media? What's your business? Where are you at? How do we get trained by you? What are ours? When are you available? I am I am in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I I am, I am easily reached um, on the uh, on the internet at functionalfitnesscleveland.com. Um, you can follow our Instagram at funfitcle. It's the simplest thing. Um, we got that early on before everybody else started popping up. Fun Fit CLE is our uh, is our Instagram and Twitter handle. Um, but you're you're West Side. You guys are West Side of Cleveland. Yeah, right? we're West Siders. Yep. West so you're side right on the Lakewood border, aren't you? What's that? Right on the Lakewood border. Yep, right there on Lakewood border. Um, right off I ninety. West 117th area. Um, further down. We're the next. We're two X's down. We're uh, on. Uh, what exit is that? Exit one or exit 104 something like that so we're a little bit further down okay um okay. but but yeah we're a couple of streets down but yeah west sider um and that's pretty much it folks where are you guys At located what's your actual physical address oh uh, uh we're in the warren village plaza so um we're in west park if you remember cleveland west park area warren village plaza has a has the uh b and b and the big old giant eagle are two our landmarks that 
usually if I say those things in front of the area, you're like, I know where that's at. You know, what are the roads? That's... What's the crossroad, but the closest intersection? Um, Warren and Edgecliff. So once you get off of Warren Road, when you come off of I-90. Oh, you're Warren Bunts. You're Warren and Bunts. Uh, further down. We're further Warren down. And, and Edgecliff. But yeah, if you're familiar with the area, we're not too far from Bunts. We're like half a mile from Bunts. Gotcha. Okay. So you're not too far. Okay. Yeah, too far. All right, we can find you on the internet. We can find you on the Instagram. I can harass yeah. you on whatever social media. <laughs> whichever outlet, whichever outlet you choose. <laughs> man, outlet. thanks for sharing everything tonight, man. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Uh, no just real quick, uh, barbarianapparel.com backslash BA hour. If you want 10% off, check that out. We're going to try and get Jermail to jump over on Team Barbarian for some of his gear. Um, obviously you're right over there by the old defense soap screw factory. You're not far from that at all, actually. So yes. check out, we got a new, there's some new product lines, some stuff they've had in the works, new branding from I got some, year. I got some wipes for Christmas actually. Oh my goodness. Yeah, Superior man. I got your product. What's that? Superior product, man. Yeah. It's not really good. And it's, 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 a, it's, uh, it's pretty cool to wipe down. Wipe to wipe down with or wipe zero. You know, so I got I got a whole thing of them over on the other side of my gym here. Do you got the regulars or the tea tree oil? What do you do? You get well the regulars are tea tree oil. Do you have peppermint? What ones do you have? I think it's eucalyptus, maybe. Well, okay, so that's the regular. You've got a regular. Yeah, yeah. yeah smoke, this is smoke. a great product. Um, a bunch of people in my family are using it. Yeah, probably would have helped me out in high school a lot. I had a lot of acne. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's a great product. They do an awesome job. Go. I got to send you swag. I got to get you yeah. some of these uh, stickers. We got all types of stuff here in the new got, studio. Hey, I'd what like do you think of my book. desktop back there that's going to go where my computer's sitting now? Check that out. I, that, that looks pretty gnarly. I like that. I like that has character. Yeah. You're right, you're uh, right. A Graham Christian Falcon, movie. the NCAA Division II pin king, Hayden Brawny from Champaign County. A St. Paris Graham Falcon literally made that for me custom. Really? Yeah. That's, yeah, I, I told him what I wanted. And he's like, <laughs> piece of furniture. <laughs> dude, that's sick. That's sick. That's uh, Poplar and Alder. Wow. He signed it. Yeah, it's awesome. It's going to fit perfect right here. Uh, when we cut off, I'm going to show you my office. I got to unplug are, you are, you are, You are legit. Yeah, no, yeah, this is a real studio. I'm in an office. It's sweet. Right. It's awesome. So, hey, hashtag. Conquer the Impossible, Barbarian Hour, Jermail Porter, Kent State's first All-American in 23 years in 2009. He made it happen. He reversed the curse. Played yeah. the NFL. He does fitness now. If you guys want to get trained by him, you want to see how to fight NFL uh, defensive linemen or linebackers, <laughs> show you all that. Or if you just want him to beat you up, um, maybe snap you down, run around, double leg you, whatever. He can do it all. So. Jamal, thanks for the time. Stick around. Thanks. Got anything else blast. for me? You good? No, dude. I had a blast. It was, it, was, it was a pleasure. Awesome, man. Thank you for the time. Stick around, all right? Yep.